All right, we are going this evening. We are continuing our study of the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the church at Rome. Last week, we were able to finish chapter 2. It was good. I liked last week. Last week was good. And this week, we're continuing now into chapter 3. And let's just move straight forward into the study. Beginning at verse 1, Paul writes, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, Amen. as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our righteous unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used to see. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Honestly, if I were an unbeliever hearing this and reading this, mm -hmm. I would be so confused right now, I wouldn't know what end to look up. Right. Mm -hmm. You really can hardly make head nor tails of what Paul is saying here, what he's trying to say, if you yeah. don't have an understanding of the context. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, I grew up in a church. For many years, I thought it was the way we were supposed to do things. You, you read the book and have absolutely no concept whatsoever of the context. Mm -hmm. Most preachers preach from the Bible yeah. and make absolutely no reference whatsoever to the context. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. They will pull a passage out and listen to me now tonight, and they will make it say something. You're right. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you're not interpreting and representing the Word of God from a position of context, you are not telling us what it says. You are making it say something. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. You hear what I'm telling you tonight? Mm -hmm. Most preachers, I've gotten to the point in my life where I can't even watch TV preachers. Oh, I know. I can't even do it. I watch these people, Brother Jack, and they will pull a passage so far out of context, yep. and then they will proceed to try and make it say something. And they are miserably butchering 
the Word of God. When you read Romans 3, it is imperative. Imperative that you remember our overview of this book. We talked about the whys, the wherefores, who it was being written to, why it appears anyway it was being written, and so on and so forth. And I've copied one of the panels from the overview. If you go down to the category purpose, Paul's purposes for writing this letter were varied. But one of the points that they make here is in number three. He sought to explain the relationship between Jew and Gentile in God's overall plan of redemption. The Jewish Christians were being rejected by the larger Gentile group in the church because the Jewish believers still felt constrained to observe dietary laws and sacred days. You've got, if you're going to read chapter 3, you have got to keep this in mind. The entire chapter, chapter 3, Paul is trying to help the Gentile believers in Rome understand the role that Judaism and Jews play in the redemptive plan. That's his whole purpose in chapter 3. Now, we were talking last week in chapter 2. He was primarily addressing who? The Jews that were in Rome. And he was talking to them about hypocrisy. He was talking to them about uh, their insistence that the law must still be followed, and yet they were not following the law. While on one hand they were saying, this is how things are supposed to be done, they were assimilating and adopting many of the same behaviors and traits of the Roman culture uh, in which they were uh, immersed. Now Paul is beginning to address the issue. He starts out with verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them committed the oracles of God. Unto them were committed the oracles of God. So again, Paul is pointing the Romans to the reality and to the fact that God used the Jewish people as a conduit. He used them specifically to bring His Word and His law to the world. The problem is, too many people think in today's world as well, that that law was given in an effort to somehow bring salvation. No, the law was not given to bring salvation. Let me tell you what the law was given to bring. Hope of salvation. You hear what I said? The hope of salvation. If you look at Jewish families and the Jewish religion, who have, these people have just celebrated the Passover. And during the course of the Passover, one of the primary uh, objectives during the Passover is an expression that we are awaiting Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. During the course of the Passover celebration, the Jewish people express that they are waiting for Elijah. Now why would they be waiting for Elijah? Because Elijah is the precursor to Messiah. Oh boy, I can make some points here. I'm easy to tell you. I will. Jewish folk have enough sense to know that one has to come before two, and two has to come before three, and three has to come before four. We've got Christian people in the world who claim Jesus is coming yesterday. Yeah. 
or tomorrow or tonight, uh -huh. and they will go out of their way to try to scare you into heaven yeah. by telling you, well, oh, the Lord can come in any minute. Amen. You know, the Jews don't look for Messiah, listen to me now, mm -hmm. until Elijah comes first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you following my line of logic yeah. here? They know that if God said that this is going to come before this, right. then this has to come before this. You don't just go, oh, Messiah will be here in a minute. No, before Messiah can get here, we first have to have yeah. the spirit of Elijah. Right. Amen. So why don't we look for the spirit of Elijah? You follow what I'm saying? Yes. I'm going to tell you, folks, there are many prophecies. And I remember growing up in the Assemblies of God as a kid. And I had this conflict when I was young. Because I remember how preachers would just go so far out of their way, try to scare us into heaven. That's right. With the threat. Yeah. Honey, the rapture ought not to be a threat. No. That's right. No. Amen. The rapture ought not to be a threat. That's right. It's Even the amen. church shouldn't use it as a threat. Amen. That's right. Amen. We ought to look for it with joy and with zeal and with enthusiasm and that's the way the world should see us looking toward the rapture Amen. Right. but I would hear preachers preaching and I had been studying scripture myself since I was a preteen mm -hmm. about 12 or so I really began to immerse myself in the word of God and I said Lord there are so many things that you tell us are going to happen prior to the rapture. And even when they asked him, Lord, when shall these things be? He'd give them a whole list. He'd give them a whole line of yeah. things, prophecies. You know, he said, all these things are going to come back. And in one place he said, but don't, don't even worry yet, because then it's not yet. That's right. So he says, right. even when you see all these things, don't worry yet. The end had not come yet. There's still right. more to come before do you follow yes, what I'm saying? Amen. Yes, amen. Well, Mother, I remember reading that as a kid. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I'd say, what are they talking about? Uh -huh. I'm going to tell you, there is nothing wrong with being realistic uh -huh. about the rapture. That's right. There's nothing wrong with being realistic about the rapture. Now, you can be realistic about the rapture, and you can become cold in your spirit. You can become a lackadaisical. You can go to sleep, and when it happens, you're going to sleep right through it. Uh -huh. yeah. That can happen if you believe the rapture is going to happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's right. But when you understand that the Jewish people look at the coming of Messiah, they understand first things first. Right. God has said there were going to be specific events. I'm going to tell you tonight, I've said this many times in the course of my teaching and preaching over the last 30 years. There is one major event that I'm waiting for. Oh, yeah. Prior to the rapture of the church, yeah. when it happens, yeah. I'm going to run out in the street. I don't care if I'm in my undies and flip-flops. <laughs> I'm going to shout, talk in tongues, yes, amen. and dance on top of my van. Because when this one event comes, it will be tantamount to Elijah arriving on the scene right. and letting us know it is so close you can taste it. Yes, amen. What is that event, you ask? The temple? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. Yep. Being rebuilt in Jerusalem. Yes, amen, amen. I will tell you. I knew a Jewish man in New York City. Some of y'all have heard this story. I don't think Lee has, so I'll repeat it. Just, you know me. I don't, I don't like to repeat myself. That's the only problem when you have such a small church, you know. Every time you get new people, they haven't heard it, so you got to repeat. So the folks have been with you a while, hear it a thousand times. I, had a, I used to attend a, it's kind of an interfaith, you might call it, Bible study in New York City. Uh, part of the LGBT community center. And I went to this. I can't say I much enjoyed it because I didn't. 
But I went to it as an outreach for our church, you know, to try to reach out to people who were trying to understand the Bible and right. trying to understand the Word of God. And there was a Jewish man who participated in this Bible study. His name was Charlie. And one day after Bible study, this is where I met Claude, who's been a long-time supporter of my ministry now. And Claude and Charlie and I, and I forget if... I think Brian, who was part of our church, he used to go sometime to this Bible study as well with me. I think the four of us went to a little restaurant and had a little something to eat. You know, been doing that a long time. That's why I look like a do. And we're talking. And I begin to explain to Charlie the apostolic Pentecostal position on the oneness of God. Not the threeness of God, but the oneness of God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are not three people. Right. There is one God just as you're one person and yet you're body, soul, and spirit. Right. That make you three people. You're one person. You just have three aspects to your one person. Right. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are three aspects to God's nature that is not by any means... Uh, it's three expressions. It is three manifestations. Right. That's all it is. It is not separate individuals. Because God has said over and over and over and over and over again that He is one, that He is singular, He is alone in heaven. He said, beside me there is no other. Amen. Amen. So unless God is one blazing liar, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. That's right. Unless He's a liar... Telling the Jewish people, I'm up here alone. There's nobody next to me. But in reality, brother, his son is sitting next to him. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. No, his son did not exist until he was born in the manger. That man-child is called the Son of God. Right. Meaning, he was born of God. He had no father but God. Right. Amen. That's why in Isaiah it said, Unto us a child is born. Unto us. Yes. A son is given. Right. God didn't have a son. Right. God doesn't procreate. He has no need of children. Amen. Well, he became the son. The father became right. the son. So he said, the father became the son. Read Isaiah 9 and 6. Amen. Read Isaiah 9. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The singular mighty God. Amen. The everlasting Father. Amen. The Prince of Peace. Who's it talking about? The Son. That's right. Amen. But it says his name shall be called the everlasting Father. That's right. The Son. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, amen. <laughs> I can get excited a little easy. Yeah. <laughs> My point tonight is the Jewish people know one thing has to happen before the other can happen. Right. The temple must be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. That's right. That is the stage from which the Antichrist will declare himself to be God. That's right. Amen. Yep. Now according to my reading, yep. there are others in Christian theology circles who may disagree with me. I don't care. I'll just tell you what I believe and what I know. When the Antichrist stands right. in the Holy of Holies right. and declares himself to be God, the Lord Jesus Christ said, he calls that uh, the abomination of desolation. desolation. In other words, that is the abomination that brings about the desolation of the world. That is when the judgment of God, the tribulation, is going to be unleashed on the world. That one action is going to bring the judgment of God. Yes, amen. The Lord Jesus Christ said, when this occurs, He said, look up. <laughs> he said, look up. He said, if you think you got time to go pack some clothes, don't bother packing. Amen. If you think you got time to go back to the house, don't even turn around. Amen. Said if you think you got time to go tell somebody, don't even worry about it. You don't have time. Right. Amen. You don't have time. 
I believe with all of my heart that at the moment the Antichrist declares himself to be God in the rebuilt, reconstituted temple, that you will hear the trump of God and the saints of the Most High will rise to meet him in the air because God must remove his people before he can unleash judgment on the world. Amen. Word of God said he will not judge the righteous with the wicked. That's right, he did. My word have mercy. The church will have already gone through its period of judgment. That's right, amen. I see. That's yeah, we're we're really we're right at the cusp of that period right this minute, folks. Yes, I'm a I'm a mid tribulationist. I believe the rapture is going to happen dead center of that tribulation. I absolutely believe that. I don't believe you'll have any way in the world knowing. So I'm not sitting here. I'm not saying you can set a date and a time. I don't think anybody, brother, is going to have any clue of what day. Right. The first day, you know, of this. The, but see, the word tribulation means judgment. Yeah. That's all it means. Three and a half years... Read the book of Daniel. You'll get more insight into the concept of a mid-tribulation rapture in the book of Daniel than you will even in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't know the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation work hand in hand yep. concerning the Antichrist in the last days. Mm -hmm. You want to understand Revelation? You, you better dig into Daniel. You want to understand... Daniel, you need to dig into Revelation because there's a lot of information between the two yes, that interlocks. Amen. Amen. And Daniel talks about in the midst of the days, yep. at the center of those seven days, those seven days representing the seven days, excuse me, the seven years mm -hmm. of the tribulation. What lasted three and a half years? What major world event, major world happening as it were, Lasted three and a half years. Christ's uh, preaching on earth. Christ's earthly ministry. Right. Yep. Lasted three and a half, and a half years. years. The church will have three and a half years mm -hmm. of judgment. Yep. It will be a time of tribulation. It, it will be a time, excuse me, I didn't mean to say tribulation. It is tribulation because mm -hmm. tribulation is judgment. Right. But it is going to be a time, I should say, of persecution. Oh. It's not going to be an easy time, folks. Now here's the flip side to the coin. Economically, in terms of living, it will be the easiest time the world has ever seen. Yeah. The only hardship you're going to have is going to be related to your faith. Right. And there are going to be a lot of people who can't take it. A lot of people, the Word of God said, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Right. And honey, if you are not grafted into the vine like you ought to be grafted into the vine, you're going to fall off the tree. Yep. Yeah. Like a dead nut. Like a piece of fruit that's overripe. You shake that tree hard enough, it just falls. Right. Okay? Then the church is removed, and the world now is given three and a half years right. of judgment. Many of the horrific images you see in the book of Revelation, the locusts that, you know, have the appearance, I mean, demonic, devilish, horrible appearances, yeah. those things will occur during the second part of the tribulation. The church will not be here for those specific things. Those are things that are going to be heaped on the world as part of their judgment. Because, see... When the Antichrist declares himself to be God, you say, well, why in the world would God unleash judgment on the world when the Antichrist declares himself to be God? Because the majority of the world's going to believe him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not like God is just unleashing judgment on the world because he said this. No, he's unleashing because the world has believed this. Yeah. In order to believe he's God, they must first have rejected Christ. Yes, that's right. Jesus said, I come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. He said, another will come in his own name, him you'll receive. Yep, that's right. 
My Lord, have mercy. Go ahead. That ties in with where Jesus said when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Because by the end of this thing, folks, you're going to really have to be able to hold on to your faith. Part of what is going to tempt you to let go of your faith, listen to me now, I don't know why I'm going into all this, I'm getting away from Romans, part of what's going to get you to let go of your faith is prosperity. Yeah, that's right. Wealth. You're going to see a period of time where there is going to be such economic blessing, as it were, poured out in our world, and everybody virtually is going to benefit from it. Even the poorest countries on the face of this planet. And this is what opens us up to what is often referred to as the Laodicean Age. This is where the Lord wrote to the book, uh, to the people of Laodicea, in the book of Revelation, he said, And you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have no need of anything. That's right. Yep. That's what's going to cause a lot of people to let go of their faith in God. They're going to have more than they've ever had. They're not going to see any need for God. Why do I need God? I don't need God. I don't need no God. Look at everything I've got. Right. Look at all i got going on for me. I'm going to tell you something. These prosperity preachers and these mega churches and this television garbage that you see on TV today, folks, it is setting believers up for that fall. That's right. It is setting them up so that when this time comes, they're going to be wiped out. And too many in the church are too blind and too foolish to see that they're being set up. They hear a preacher like me get up and say that. Oh, and they just think, I'm stupid. I don't know what I'm talking about. Blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you, God called me to a prophetic ministry when I was a kid. I trust what God shows me. I trust what the Lord tells me. There have been times, uh, Lee, that I've questioned what God told me. And then, lo and behold, here it comes. It happens exactly the way He told me as the will. There, you know, every time I've been foolish enough to question what the Lord has yeah. shown me, yeah. it comes about and happens. Yeah. It not always happen in the time frame. I might think, you know, it's going to happen, but it happens. Amen. All right, so Paul, let's get back to Romans. Paul is trying to help the Romans understand the role that the Jewish nation and the Jewish people have played in the salvation process. You see, you can't really have a rock-solid faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying you can't have faith. Yeah. Listen carefully. I said you cannot have rock-solid faith in the Lord Jesus Christ without understanding His fulfillment of prophecy. See, a lot of people... Oh, I believe Jesus was the Son of God. I believe Jesus saved, you know, died on the cross to save the world. Really? Why do you believe that? Well, because my grandma used to say, because I was raised in a church that said, uh -huh. Amen. When you understand that there were dozens and dozens and dozens of prophecies written, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the Lord was born and He fulfilled every one of them. That's right. Amen. right down to His ride into Jerusalem mm -hmm. on quote Good Friday yep. or I'm sorry, on Palm Sunday on the back of a baby mule yep. <laughs> That was foretold. That's right. That was prophesied. Amen. That was not an accident. Somebody might say, well, Jesus knew that the prophecy said that Messiah would come in riding on the colt, the foal of an ass. And so therefore, he did that because he knew. Okay, he might have known that, but he also knew that he must needs go into Jerusalem to be crucified. Right. But in three days, I'll see you later. That's right. I'll see you again. Amen. 
He also, he kept saying over and over again, this was going to happen, and this is how this is going to take place. Kept saying it over and over again. People didn't want to listen. People didn't want to believe. It wasn't something they were comfortable hearing, but it was the truth. But there was prophecy after prophecy. Even people who were not Jewish were familiar with certain prophecies concerning the Hebrew Messiah. And this is why we have the wise men That's coming right. from the east right. at the birth of the Lord. And they weren't even, they weren't even Jewish. Yeah. That wasn't even their religion. That's right. But they were familiar with the folklore, if you want to call That's it that. Right. They were familiar with the prophecies. They were familiar yeah. with the things that uh, were said were going to transpire when the Hebrew king was born. That's right. Right, amen. When you understand how the Lord fulfilled prophecy, I'm going to tell you, it really will cement your faith. Yes, amen. It'll really set your faith in stone, honey. Because this is not just some lunatic standing on the street corner saying, Hi, everybody, I'm the Son of God. There is, I have no earthly father. The only father I have is the Spirit of Almighty God. He wasn't just a lunatic standing on the side of the street saying this. Right, there were hundreds of prophecies. There were dozens and dozens and yes, dozens of prophecies yes. that came over the course of hundreds of years from dozens of various authors. They didn't all come from the same person. That's right. They weren't all found in the same book. Right. You know how hard it is to really get a grasp of Scripture? I've been studying this book since I was a kid. And I still read stuff, and I still get revelation, and I still get insight, and I still get surprised sometimes. Yes, amen. <laughs> so to suggest that Jesus just had a real, he knew all these things that the Bible said about the Messiah, and so he purposely set out to fulfill all these things. Honey, you couldn't do it if you wanted to. That's right. Amen. You couldn't have done it if you wanted to. For one thing, he wasn't old enough to influence Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem if he wanted to. That's right. He was in the belly. Yes, amen. And yet, the prophecy said he'd be born in Bethlehem of Judea. That's right. Oh, hallelujah. Mommy and stepdaddy were living in Nazareth. Yes, amen. Amen. It was quite a journey to Bethlehem. Yep. But God had it all set up so that tax season would arrive yes, and Joseph would have to make the journey to Bethlehem. Yep. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. Here's something you might not have thought about. Mary did not need to go with him. There was nothing that required Mary to go with Joseph. She could have stayed at home. The woman was pregnant. Yeah. But somehow, nine months along, ready to pop at any minute, she decides, I'm going with you. Yeah. Amen. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> when God wants to get something done, Amen. it gets done. Amen. When the Lord wants something to happen a certain way, baby, it happens Amen. exactly the way the Lord wants it to happen. Amen. I don't know about you, but there have been many occasions in my life where I can see the hand of God at work putting circumstances all together and Amen. just putting, you know, and so that when it all falls into place, I stand there looking and saying, Dear God, yes. Amen. it is amazing how the Lord can cause things to come about exactly the way He wants them to come about Amen. so that you're exactly in the right place at exactly the right time. Amen. So old Mary, she wound up in Bethlehem and she wound up having the baby in Bethlehem. Amen. That is not where they were living. That's right. But the prophecy said He'd be born there. That's right. <laughs> so Paul is trying to help the Romans understand. You've got to understand, God gave the law 
to the people of Israel, but he did not merely give the law. He also used the prophets. Uh -huh. When the Word of God speaks of the foundation of the New Testament church, mm -hmm. it doesn't mention the law. Nope. But it mentions the prophets. Yep. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. The foundation of the church, according to Ephesians and Galatians, is... The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. You gotta understand. You gotta understand the work of the prophets in the process of all this. If you don't understand the work of the prophets, you're gonna really be missing something. You're, there's gonna be a lot to this story that you're gonna miss. And Paul's trying to help these Romans understand. Let me tell you, what advantage then is there to the Jew? He says, well, in a lot of ways, every advantage. In a lot of ways, they've got every advantage. Well, how come? Because, well, look, look at how God used them. He gave them the law. He spoke to them through the prophets. Everything he did, he did in, with, by, and through the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything he did was channeled through the Jewish nation. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, the Jews are highly advantaged. you got to remember, remember what I said a few minutes ago, remember the overview. Mm -hmm. The Romans were rejecting the Jewish Christians. Because the Jewish Christians were still feeling the need to embrace the law and to live up to certain dietary standards and to observe certain holy days. So Paul's trying to say, don't you, let me, let me help you understand something. These folks are very blessed people. Yeah. You're trying to push them out. Well, i got news for you. There'd be no gospel if it wasn't for them. Right. You wouldn't even have a Jesus if it wasn't for these people. So, so he's trying to help. And it's interesting because when you look at the language Paul uses in writing to the Romans, he refers to the Jews as them. Mm -hmm. He refers to them in the third person. In other words, what I'm getting at, he doesn't necessarily identify himself as part of that pact right. at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, they know Paul's Jewish. But what he's trying to do is he doesn't want it to come across like us against them. Right. Me against you. You know what I'm saying? So he's presenting it kind of with him stepping aside and leaving his Jewish identity off to the side. Yeah. Because if, if, I'm, if I'm coming at you from that Jewish identity, I may just come across as proud. I may just come yeah. across as... as uh, uppity, you know. So I'm going to come I'm going to come to you and I'm going to talk about them. And they. So this is how Paul addresses this issue with them. Then he goes on to say, in verse 2, he said, Much every way. See, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? He said, Much every way. Well, it's almost like there's every advantage. Mm -hmm. Chiefly for the primary reason, because that unto them, notice he didn't say unto us. Right. He said, unto them were committed the oracles of God. The oracles of God, this term refers to every spoken utterance yep. that came from God. This would include the law and the prophets. Okay? You notice he doesn't just talk about the law here. It's not just, he's not pointing to the law. You remember when we were talking earlier about how the Jews in, in the earlier chapters, how the Jews uh, really had almost a little bit of an overblown sense of self because God had given them the law and they valued the law so highly and, and the, the law was so prized by them that there was kind of that almost an arrogance. Well, so Paul is saying here, the oracles of God. He didn't say the law. Verse 3, for what if some did not believe? 
Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? He said, listen, every Jew in the Jewish family didn't have to believe in God, didn't have to believe what God said, didn't have to believe the prophets, didn't have to embrace the law in order for the law to accomplish what it was meant to accomplish. That's right. Even if they didn't believe, it doesn't change a thing. It does not somehow nullify the law of God because there were many times when the Jewish people did not act like they believed it. Did not act like they should have acted. So Paul's trying to help them understand, probably like a lot of preachers, sometimes when you preach, I remember when I was a kid, I'd be sitting there listening to the pastor preach, and all of a sudden the pastor would say, Now there are some of you who may be thinking or may be asking, and then he'd say something, and I'd be sitting there saying, He read my mind. <laughs> How did he know? Because that would be the very thought that was just going through my head. And the pastor, and some of you are thinking, and some of you, you remember how Jesus did this? There were many times that the Word of God said, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, and I'll tell you, the anointing will help to make you a lot of times aware of what's going on in the audience's thinking. You may, as a preacher, I may not even realize this is what's happening. Honestly, I, I may not even realize it, but all of a sudden, the thought will come into my head, now somebody will be thinking this, or somebody will be questioning that, and then I feel the need to go ahead and address that and answer that. And I'll have somebody at the end of the service say, you know, brother, when you were talking about this, and you said this, the thought went through my head, blah, 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 blah. and by God, that was the very next thing you addressed. That was the very next thing you talked about. I've been preaching Pentecost for a lot of years. Do you know how many times I've had people say that to me? Hundreds. Hundreds of times. And they are in amazement. You, it, you can sense there was something, something supernatural at work. Because how the world... What you're talking about. How is it that the very next words out of your mouth addressed the first question that came into my mind about what you just said? And you can literally just see the supernatural at work. You can see the anointing at work. All right? Paul says now here, he said, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? It may very well be that Paul is answering a question that the readers now are asking. Well, if these people are so blessed that God gave the oracles of God through them and He did all this, why did they not always act right? Why did they so many times disobey God? Why did they so many times bring the anger of God down upon their heads? Why so many times? And Paul turns around and answers their question. Do you follow what I'm saying? In my mind, anyway, I have a feeling that's what was going on here. He's answering a question that they haven't even asked. But I guarantee you, whoever's reading this was thinking this. So Paul's answering that question. He's saying, do you think that just because the Jewish people, because it was a well-known fact that Jewish people had not always lived according to the law they had been given. I mean, this wasn't something only the Jews knew. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of their history. Uh -huh. And so, the Roman reading this may be thinking, yeah, well, for people that God gave all this to, they sure didn't live up to it. They sure didn't act like this was something they believed in. And, something they, and then he turns around and says, well, do you think their unbelief had any effect yeah. on what God had given them? Do you think their unbelief had any effect on the plan that God had put into effect through them? No! Nope. Not at all. That's right. Verse 4, God forbid. <laughs> Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. My Lord, have mercy. This is why it kills me when I see people, brother, lose their faith in God because of something somebody did. 
I was so disappointed in Brother Swagger. Yeah. Uh-huh. When old Jimmy got caught being with a hooker, oh brother, I was so disappointed I just couldn't serve the Lord anymore. Why? Yeah. Because he couldn't live it. Right, amen. Let God be true and every amen. man a liar. Honey, I what men do, what men say, what men are able to live doesn't have one effect iota on what God has said or what God can do and what God has promised. Amen. No, let amen. God be true and every man a liar. Amen. This is one reason why I have more mic trouble again. This is one reason why I am not running to the theater. To see, heaven is real. Oh, yeah, amen. I don't need a ten-year-old kid to tell me yeah. amen. that heaven is real. Amen. That's right. God has told me amen. that heaven is real. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. The Word of God tells me that heaven is real. Mm -hmm. Let God be true. Amen. And every man a liar. Amen. I don't need you to lend your support to Amen. what God has said. Amen. If God said it, it is so. Amen. Hallelujah to God. If God said it, then it is so. I don't need any further evidence. Right. Amen. Amen. My Lord have mercy. We got so-called Christian people running by the thousands to the theaters. Bringing their loved ones, hoping this will convince them to be saved. Honey, your confidence had better be in what God says in His Word and not what some five, eight, ten year old boy said. Yes, amen. Who's died and come back. Amen. The only people who know what really lies after death, listen to me carefully now, are those who have. Are those who have not come back. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. That's right. I hope That's you right. heard me now. Yes. Uh -huh. Amen. The only people who know for a fact, because I'm going to tell you a little secret, Satan is a deceiver. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you think he cannot deceive you with a near-death experience, That's right. you're out of your mind. When you step into his realm, when you step into the spiritual realm, right. if you think Satan can't deceive you, guess again. That's right. I've heard things said by people. I've got videos and all that about near-death experiences and all this. And I hear some of the things people say, and it contradicts the Word yes. of God. Amen. Amen. What they're claiming, brother... It's in complete contradiction to the Word of God. Yep. What am I going to believe? Uh -huh. The Word of God, yep. Heard one guy talk about Lee, how he had died and he was descending into hell. And he could feel the hands of demons grabbing hold of him. I mean, it was a scary picture that he was drawing. Yes. And all of a sudden I remembered... What I was taught as a child in Sunday school. And I cried out, oh Jesus, help me. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden those hands let loose. And I began to ascend upward. Really? Really? Mm -hmm. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Mm -hmm. In other words, you reap what you've sown in life. Yep. immediately upon death. Yep. So you're telling me that after I've died, I can still repent. Mm -hmm. Hello now. Uh -huh. There's still hope after I've died. Oh, now doesn't that put a lot of images mm -hmm. in people's minds right. uh -huh. who don't want to take the time or put forth the effort to live for the Lord in this life. That's mm -hmm. right, yeah. They figure, it's okay, because I heard this guy say. That's right, amen. So I know when I die, all I have to do is say, Jesus, help me. And 
and he'll do so. Yeah. I'm telling you, Satan is filling up hell with that lie. Do you follow what I'm yes. saying? Amen. You don't trust what people say. Yes. Right. Amen. A lot of people in our community, especially in LGBT circles where unfortunately a lot of people have gone to, to what I call hyper-liberal theology. I mean, it's so liberal and screwed up, it's not even funny. They don't believe anything, hardly anymore. They think I'm just out of my mind. Because I still believe the Word of God. Yes, amen. Let God be true. Amen. And every man a liar. Honey, I'm going to trust that book till the minute I'm dead or the rapture takes place. I'm going to put my confidence in the Word of God. That's why I don't believe in ghosts. Amen. Amen. Hello now. That's why I don't believe in hauntings. Amen. Because the Word of God does not offer us any support for a belief that after death we can work things out. Yeah. Amen. Hello now. Oh, we got a psychic on television. I've told you before, I watch a lot of these shows, not necessarily every day or every week, but, you know, I watch them. Because I'm looking at the false information, the false teaching they're putting out. And there's a psychic on TV, and she takes uh, famous people, actors and actresses, back to the scene of a haunting experience they had and she helps put all the pieces together brother for them to understand who this person was and what why they had this experience and so on and so forth and well you know they're just trying to work out mm. sweetheart i got news for you yeah the time has passed for Amen. that Amen. the time has passed for that the word of god said the dead know nothing once you close your eyes to death, that's it. Mm -hmm. There is You don't have opportunity at this point to make things right. You don't have opportunities at this point to fix what was broken. Yes, but see, there are demon spirits that run around and they represent themselves as your great aunt Martha and your old grandma, you know, mama, and this one and that one. And... They want to send you the message that after death, see, I couldn't go anywhere, darling, until I finished communicating with you and letting you know, because I just couldn't be at peace until you knew this or you knew that. That's right. Yeah. Oh, you mean so after I die, there's still an opportunity for me to fix things that were broken? There, there's still opportunity for me? See, that's what the enemy wants you to believe. So you better be real careful about putting your confidence in people. Amen. Putting your confidence, never mind dead people. You know, I've said it when I was teaching on the paranormal. I said, it amazes me how somebody can walk up to us on the, in the park lot and give us a tale of woe about how, well, you know, my wife's pregnant and... We were not a gas down the road a ways, and I'm just trying to get enough money to get gas in the car so I can take her to the hospital so she can have our baby. And most of us will not immediately believe this person that we've never met, that we don't know. Matter of fact, most of us have enough sense to know there's a good possibility, if not even a good probability, they're full of malarkey. And they're just giving us a soap job. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yet, we've got people running around the world getting messages from invisible sources. Mm -hmm. And putting all the confidence in the world That's in right. every word that comes from these invisible sources. Yes, amen. That's right. You don't know what that is you're talking to. You don't know who that is you're talking Amen. to. Even if, even if it were a person who has died and moved on to the great beyond, how do you know they're not the biggest lion sack of mud that ever lived? <laughs> how is it when somebody dies, all of a sudden everybody turns into honest ape? Yeah, really. 
But do you see? Seriously, do you see the foolishness? You know, you got old Zach Bagans. Everything he hears through his little magical, mystical machine. Woo! Everything he hears, he believes. Everything they say is a fact. Yeah. You don't know what you're talking to. That's right. If you could see the entity that is communicating with you, and you could see it for what it really is, it would probably scare you into sawing yourself. To be frank. Mm -hmm. But do you see how people do? Let God be true. And every man a liar. Yeah. This is why folks. It is so imperative. That we have. A rock solid conviction. In the word of God. Amen. When I come against demons. And I start casting demons out in Jesus name. I don't, they can bark, they can howl, they can do all the foolishness they want to do. I tell them to shut up. Amen. And I'm not afraid of them. And I've heard some pretty scary stuff come out of demoniacs in my day. Yes, amen. They don't spook me, they don't bother me. You know why? Because let God be true and every man amen. a liar. God said, God said, I've given you power to tread upon That's serpents. Right, I've given you power to tread upon scorpions. When these things try to act foolish and they try to act up, I say, shut up. The word of God has told me that he's given me power to tread upon serpents and scorpions against all the evil and wickedness of this world. Amen. I've got power over you. Amen. You answer to me, buddy. Amen. Amen. And I can speak Amen. that with Amen. conviction. Amen. I'm not just saying words. Amen. I'm speaking that with conviction. Why? Because I honestly believe. That's Let right. God be true. And every man a liar. If it is not in the word of God, it is not so. If it is in the word of God, it is so. The grass withers, yeah. the flower fades, but the word of our God yeah. shall stand forever. If there is anything that I could impart to you as members of this church, it would be, the most important thing I could give you would be a conviction amen. concerning the Word of God. Yes, amen. That is the one thing. I'm going to tell you, I grew up in the Assemblies of God, and the Assemblies of God made the biggest mistake in the world with me. They taught me to believe the Bible. <laughs> they did. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you honestly, brother, if there's a movement on this planet that preaches that more than the assemblies of God, I don't know who it is. Did they do it? No. <laughs> they rewrite it, retranslate it, right. re explain it till the cows come home. However, they made a big mistake with me. Because I believe the message, right. regardless of what the messenger was doing. That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. I can believe what they're saying. I don't have to do things the way they're doing it. That's right. Mm -hmm. I sit there and watch the assemblies of God rewrite the scriptures over and over again, explain away this, explain away that. That's right, amen. But you know what? In the course of growing up in an environment where I'm constantly being told, you must trust the word of God. You must put your confidence in the word of God. I did. Amen. I do. I still amen. am. Yep, amen. Amen. Hadn't failed me yet. That's right. Hasn't failed me yet. Let God be true. Paul said, listen, it doesn't matter how the Jewish people acted historically. It doesn't matter how miserably they failed spiritually. It does not affect the plan that God put into effect through them and by them and with them. Doesn't affect that plan one iota. I've said it before, I'll say it again. People, I wouldn't go to your church because I think you're going to split hell wide open. I don't believe why you live. Don't believe. Honey, I got news for you. I could preach you into heaven and still go to hell. Yes, amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Uh -huh. 
Paul said, lest having preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. He said, I can preach you into heaven and still split hell wide open. Yep. So while you're sitting there worrying about how I live my life, my life doesn't affect the message. That's right. My imperfection doesn't change the truth. Amen. Whether I'm doing it like I preach it, whether I do it like I say I'm doing it, whether I'm living it like I say I'm living it, honey, guess what? The Word of God is the Word of God. Amen. It stands alone. It is not affected by my imperfection. It is not affected by my sin. It is not affected by my weakness. Jimmy Swaggart was having liaisons, and I'm sorry to say it like this, I don't mean to sound mean. He was having liaisons with hookers, and honey, people were still receiving the Holy Ghost under his ministry. People were still being healed. Why? Because God is God. Let God be true. Shout of this. Yes, I'm telling you, child, wait till we start our fellowship conference next week. Oof. You might want to keep Jackie away. Because this preacher bound to shout a little, scare her out of her mind. That's what happens when you grow up Church of Christ. <laughs> I'm teasing. Amen. All right. But if our unrighteousness Commend the righteousness of God. What shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, yet why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Again, this is Paul saying. My imperfection. Now he's speaking, he's not speaking here personally. Of him, he's speaking kind of in a generalized fashion. Okay, he's saying, you know, if my sin, my imperfection. Yeah. He said, if through all my sin and my imperfection, God is still glorified. And God still works through me. I remember when I was a young preacher man and I had this issue I was living with. Mm -hmm. And boy, brother, that issue used to keep me up at night, haunt me, used to cause me immense depression, and oh God, I went through some hard times. Mm -hmm. And yet, I could get in the pulpit and preach the Word of God and great things would happen. And many, many times I would look up toward heaven and say, Lord, I don't get it. I am so imperfect. I've got all this stuff going on inside of me. I've got all this conflict. I've got all this. And yet you still, still somehow glorify yourself in me and through me. I just don't get it. You know, it took me years before I finally got it. The Lord finally spoke after I came out and all that and said, because it's never been about you. That's right, amen. Ooh, Jesus, it has amen. never been about you. Amen. Not for, whoo, hallelujah. Amen. Not for one yes, minute. Amen. Not for one minute has this been about you. Amen. You, whoo, yes, amen. you put yourself you. in the big middle of everything. Yes, amen. See, I had you in the right perspective. I never thought you were perfect, even when you were trying to think you were. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought you had it all together, even when you thought you had it all together. Amen. I never thought you were doing it all right, even when you thought you were doing it all yes. right. Amen. But one thing about you, just like old David, as imperfect as you were, you were a man after my own heart. Amen. You wanted all the right things, you just didn't know how to get there. That's right. You Amen. wanted to do all the right things, you just didn't know how to make it happen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. So it was never about you. So your biggest mistake was you Amen. thought everything hinged on you. No. Nothing. No. Everything hinges on the Word of God. Amen. That's why Paul said, preach the Word. The instant in season and out of season. Amen. 
My Lord, have mercy. Preach the word. He didn't say, be perfect. Amen. Be sinless. No, because that would put the emphasis on us. That's uh -huh. right. And the effectiveness. I'm going to tell you, most people look at preachers and preaching as though the effectiveness of the gospel message yeah. hinges on the way the preacher is living his life. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. I'm going to say something tonight. I hope to God we've got a UPC or watching us on video. Because I'm going to stir up a hornet's nest. There's a preacher in the UPC who's as popular and well known as any that has ever lived. This guy is just, it amazes me how popular he is. If this man is not gay, my name is Oval Redenbacher. <laughs> you got to see it. You just, and Jack knows who I'm talking about. You got to see it. This man, the only thing he's lacking is putting on a tutu <laughs> and carrying a purse into the church with him. <laughs> Let's just worship the Lord. <laughs> you know what it is. Anybody in that organization just knew right now who I'm talking about. I'm not kidding. They know exactly who I'm talking about. Because what I just demonstrated to you, I was not exaggerated. That's exactly how he does. I have it on fairly reliable source that this man has destroyed people's lives who have outed him without a thought he would paint them the liar and their ministry and their lives would go down the toilet and he just kept doing what he's been doing Now, I'm gonna, I said all that to say this. Does that change the effectiveness of one word that he preaches? Nope. Is he going to stand before God in the judgment and answer? You better believe it. You better believe it. This is what Paul's talking about here, folks. He's trying to help the Romans understand that not only did, the, did God use the Jewish people, but He used them in spite of their failure, in spite of their shortcomings, in spite of their sin, in spite of their unbelief. I got news for you today, children. Good news. God can still use you in spite of your sin, in spite of your shortcoming, in spite of your unbelief, in spite of your failures, in spite of your slipping and sliding. Yes, amen. God is so much bigger than we are. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm liking this pretty good. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have to stop here. It is 9 o'clock. I didn't realize we'd gotten there so quickly. <laughs> Amen. All right. So we're going to start then uh, next week. We're going to resume at about verse 8 in Romans chapter 3.